good morning. Uh, thanks so much for making it to CSIS despite the hot weather. Um, my name is Jane Nakano. I'm the fellow with CSIS Energy and National Security Program. And then it is my honor to welcome back Anne-Sophie Corbeau uh, to CSIS and especially to the, to the new building. I think this is your first visit to the 21st century looking new building. And uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, she is uh, one of the the best international uh, natural gas market experts. Uh, she's with the International Energy Agency uh, based in Paris. She joined IEA in March 2009 as senior gas expert at their uh, gas, coal, and power division. And she, uh, there she's responsible for managing the research on uh, global gas markets and is the main author of the publication, The Midterm Gas Market Report. Uh, prior to her assignment at IEA, uh, Anne-Sophie worked at the Cambridge Energy Research Associates as Associate Director in the European Gas Team. And today, uh, it is our pleasure to host her, uh, and uh, she is here to share with you the highlights from their uh, latest midterm gas market report. Um, so here she is. Thank you. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be back in Washington. It has been two years for me because uh, last year I had actually um, two babies, a real one who is now 13 months old and a book. So now I am back with the medium term gas market report 2014 and I'm going to give you the main conclusions and basically to drive you around the world to look at how gas demand and supply are evolving in the world. So in terms of the key conclusions, we can say that gas demand in 2012 was not extraordinarily growing. It was growing only by 1.2%, which is actually much lower than what we saw uh, over the last decade, which was closer to 2.9%. However, we are slightly more optimistic for the development over the next few years, over the period 2013-2019, with gas demand increasing at 2.2%. The main drivers behind this growth in terms of regions are, without any surprise, China, then the Middle East. But in contrast, we do not anticipate any growth in Europe and the former Soviet Union. Of course, in order to meet this demand, which is going to be about 500 billion cubic meters of additional gas demand, you need supply. And here we see a change. Two OECD regions, OECD America, so this is essentially the United States, as well as OECD Asia Oceania, essentially Australia, are going to be responsible for 40% of the incremental supply. Also of not, uh, the Middle East is bringing a lot of additional natural gas, but in contrast, the former Soviet Union doesn't bring that much additional gas, and I will come back to that. The other interesting point about these two OECD regions contributing so much in terms of additional supply is that they are going to bring new LNG to the market. Global gas trade is going to expand by one third, but global LNG trade is going to increase by 40%, reaching 450 BCM by 2019. Let's now have a look back at what happened in 2013. As I said, not a good year for the gas industry in general. For once, natural gas grew less than oil, which was 1.4%. We anticipate coal to be at 3 to 4 percent, and renewable energy is definitely above 4 percent. So this is really underperforming for natural gas. And you can see a striking difference between the different regions, and in particular, I want to highlight China, which is still growing at a healthy 13 percent. I mean, China is the fastest growing region in the world, by far, also in terms of volumes, despite the fact that this is only the third largest gas user in the world. But in contrast, you have also decline of natural gas demand in other regions, in particular in Europe, which was extremely surprising considering that we had a very long winter which actually lasted until the beginning of June. So 
In Europe, the perspectives are definitely not good. Gas demand is declining in industry, in power generation in particular, and the outlook, as I will explain later, are not particularly promising. You may also be surprised by the decline in non-OECD Asia. Actually, here, this is an illustration of the fact that even if you have a relatively high potential demand, you do not always have the supply available in order to meet this demand. In contrast, some countries have the means to afford for relatively expensive supplies, and this is the case for Latin America. Because of droughts last year, Latin America needed to use more gas power generation, and therefore, companies like Petrobras from Brazil were hunting for LNG cargoes, and they were paying extremely high gas prices, 19 to 20 dollars per MBTU. So, real money there. As I mentioned, when we look forward, we anticipate a higher growth of natural gas demand, 2.2%. It's important, however, to see that this represents a slight downward revision in terms of our forecast compared to the previous year. Uh, in the medium-term gas market report 2013, we had 2.4%, and here now this is 2.2%. Again, here in this picture, this is China, which is by far driving the demand picture. China will contribute to roughly one third of the additional gas demand, followed by the Middle East. And really, at the other end of this picture, former Soviet Union and Europe, which are beautifully growing by slightly less than one BCM. So you can actually say there is no growth. And of course, this picture is only looking at the difference between 2013 and 2019. But during this forecast period, natural gas demand in both regions will spend most of the time actually going back, because it, it's going to be relatively low in 2014, going back to 2013 level by 2019. The relatively modest growth, in, to some extent, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia reflects the fact that for these countries, where relatively low domestic gas prices prevail, there is definitely a problem in terms of increasing domestic gas production or affording for more expensive imports by pipeline or by LNG. China is the elephant in the room. Of course, everybody knows that the Chinese economy is slowing down. Yes, but at the same time, we do not anticipate this to have a tremendous impact on natural gas demand, because now the most important thing is local air pollution. I'm sure you have all seen pictures of winter in Beijing. There is a lot of local air pollution because of heating, and planes are stranded. So this is now becoming priority number one, and this is driving higher demand in absolutely every single sector. Residential, industry, power generation, of course, but also, as you can see in the orange line, transport. China is actually the number one in terms of the gas consumption in the transport sector with over 1.5 million natural gas vehicles. And they are now adding something like 500,000 NGVs per year. So this is a market which has a lot of potential, as you can see in this picture. China, however, is not going to meet this demand entirely by domestic gas production. They have a lot of potential, but uh, we are relatively conservative in terms of the medium-term development. So additional imports are going to be critical, and these additional imports are going to be both gas coming from Central Asia or Myanmar, as well as LNG. <sighs> My home region, Europe, we can really say that there is no miracle to expect there. Demand in the residential sector on a slightly declining path because of energy efficiency. Industry between high gas prices and relatively low economic growth, it's difficult to be hopeful. At best, we expect a stabilization of industrial gas demand. For power generation, this is a little bit more complicated because actually power generation is slightly coming back, not because the 
um, performances of gas power plants are becoming better, but simply because in some regions, like the United Kingdom, coal power plants are retired because of environmental constraints. So actually, natural gas is winning there by default. But compared to the levels that we had in 2007, 2008, you can see that natural gas demand in the power generation sector is awfully low. So during most of this period, 2014, 2019, we are going to spend our time coming back to the level of 2013 with a very low point in 2014 because gas demand has already collapsed by something like 20% over the first quarter, not because of fear of Russia or energy efficiency, measures, no, no, because of the very mild weather. I stopped heating, actually, my, my home uh, in February, and I think this can apply more or less to most people in Europe. So the results for the gas companies in Europe are not going to be great, and there is a potential that this number may be actually the four, 470 BCM, so 34 BCM drop compared to last year may be actually relatively optimistic. It could even be lower than that. And as a result, well, gas prices are low in Europe, and some gas power plants are coming back in the money. That's at least the good news for Europe. Well, let's now talk about the United States. People tend to focus on what happened in 2012. I think it's a mistake. 2012 is a pass. Of course, in 2012, we had a very important and rapid increase of the use of gas in power generation sector, but it was because gas prices were very low, there was a very mild winter followed by a hot summer. 2013, actually, the situation reversed back to normal, and actually, if you were just deleting the year 2012, you could see that there is a growth, a kind of continuous growth of natural gas demand in the power generation sector, and a continuous decline of coal fire generation. We anticipate this kind of trend to continue over the forecast period, however, at a more moderate pace. Um, we see that at $4 or $4.50, gas power plants have more difficulties, actually, to push away uh, coal fire plants unless there are stricter environmental regulations. Another region which is really very important because it illustrates the difficulties that developing countries have to access to natural gas. There are a lot of gas resources in Asia, in non-OECD Asia. But look at India, for example. Gas production there is declining. Uh, same thing happening in Malaysia. A lot of countries are becoming LNG importers, even if at the same time they are also exporting LNG. And this is a trend which is expected to continue. So the consequence is that for non-OECD Asia, this region is going to go progressively from being a net exporter to be just at the limit of being a net importer by 2019. And it will import increasing volumes of LNG because this is the only thing that they can actually uh, get in this region due to the geography. Let's now look at what is going on in terms of sectors. Of course, as usual, the power generation sector is the main contributor to additional natural gas demand, increasing by over 250 billion cubic meters. That sounds great. But actually, in terms of the share of gas in the power generation mix, this is only increasing by 0.5%, so that natural gas will represent 22% of the power generation mix. Actually, in every single region, you have competition between natural gas and something else. Well, here in the US, for example, uh, this is notably coal. This is also definitely coal, but also renewable um, in, um, in Europe. This is coal as well in Asia, in China. While in the Middle East, the main competitor in the relatively, relative absence of nuclear and, uh, and renewable there is oil. I mean, nuclear and renewable, they are starting to come, but uh, they do not represent a high share, as you can see on this graphic, uh, the, the fourth uh, bar starting from the right. So to summarize, 
those who think that because natural gas is the least polluting of all the combustible fuels and should have an easy life in getting additional market shares in every single region, well, unfortunately, they are wrong. And the best example of that is Europe, where natural gas demand may be a clean burning fuel, but nevertheless, the gas demand is going down very, very fast. Let's talk about new potential now. And one of these examples is transport. And by transport, this is everything from road transport, trucks, um, train, and also potentially shipping. Um, for those who were here last year, you may remember that uh, we looked in detail at the road transport, uh, something that we have done again. We are still relatively bullish on the development of natural gas in road transport, seeing a, more than a doubling of natural gas demand in this sector from 45 to over 90 billion cubic meters. But we also looked at another part of the transport sector, which is the shipping industry. Um, we agree this is actually more for post-2020, but we see a potential there for the development of natural gas use, not only for international seas, but also for domestic navigation. Again, because of new regulation being put in terms of sulfur and also because of countries being aware that, well, there is simply too much pollution. So seeing, for example, um, natural gas-based shipping on the rivers in China, this is definitely not impossible and could happen relatively soon. I think this is actually happening right now because some companies have pledged to invest in this particular sector. So we do see some use of gas in the transport sector, in the, in the maritime transport sector in China. Supply. Okay, so where is gas going to come from? As I mentioned, two OECD regions, as well as the Middle East, are the main contributor to additional natural gas production over the period 2013-2019, as you can see. And at the bottom of the spectrum, well, there is Europe, where there is absolutely no miracle. Natural gas production there is not going to increase, despite uh, all the potential of shale gas, which is discussed, whereas this potential is unlikely to concretize in significant volumes by 2019. The other quite interesting point in this graphic is that former Soviet Union gas production is not increasing that much. It's not a problem of potential for once. It's a problem of the natural gas demand in this region doesn't increase. Second problem, there is competition to supply Europe. And here we anticipate relatively stable or slightly declining Russian exports to Europe. And third, we have been very conservative in terms of the new export infrastructure from Russia to global gas market. In particular, the Yamal LNG project, which is announced for 2018. We have pu pushed it back to early 2020, as well as a widely discussed uh, China-Russia gas pipeline. This one is definitely going to arrive, but we anticipate more a 2020 starting date. Should these two projects come online a little bit earlier, then the numbers for FSU region would be, of course, slightly better. Another point that I want to make about this graphic is Actually, what is the contribution of these different countries towards their demand or towards additional incremental um, international trade? Well, we have actually very wide difference. China, Latin America, Asia, Lat uh, Asia are going to actually contribute only to meet their natural gas demand growth which means that whatever exports these countries have, it's going to decline. The Middle East also falls in this category. But look at countries like OECD Americas, Asia Oceania, uh, former Soviet Union, and Africa. These countries are also going to bring additional gas volumes to global gas market, either in the form of pipeline export or LNG. So there is really a big difference on how these countries are actually using their incremental gas production if they have, which is not the case for Europe. Talking about the Middle East, well, 
I want really to kill an idea, which is that the Middle East has plenty of gas and uh, can produce as much as it wants. Well, yes, in theory, there is a lot of gas, quite actually concentrated in a couple of countries. But a lot of the Middle Eastern countries are actually importing natural gas. This is the case for the Emirates, for Kuwait, for Oman, for Iran as well. Uh, it was the case for Lebanon and Syria before the war. It's also the case for Jordan. So it doesn't leave us with a lot of countries which are actually fine. I mean, the only country which is so far fine in terms of meeting both its additional gas demand and export commitments, this is Qatar. Saudi Arabia is self-sufficient, but would definitely love to have more gas being developed because it still has to burn a lot of oil and an increasing amount of oil in the power generation sector. We, we looked at that a little bit in detail this time. And also, um, Iraq, well, the situation in Iraq, of course, was uh, after what we, when we published uh, this report. Um, what we can say is that actually, Iraq is a self-sufficient country in terms of natural gas. So if there is a problem in terms of gas production, this is only going to affect Iraq, and in particular, quite likely, the power generation sector. So that would mean lower power generation for the, for the people living there, which is quite unfortunate. Another region which has uh, also quite a bullish forecast in terms of gas production, as you can see, it was not the case over the history. We had a relatively flat outlook or flat historical line with problems in Algeria, problems in Egypt, and problems in Nigeria, which are really the three main gas producers in Africa. Now, we anticipate that in Algeria, they are going to have a lot of discoveries, finally, after a lot of delays coming online over the period 2014, 2019. Uh, Egypt, a small recovery but uh, we do not anticipate miracles there because companies are a little bit fed up of, um, well, getting relatively low gas prices. This is actually under discussion right now. Uh, they are also afraid of the political instability, and they are also mostly not getting paid. And when you are BG and you are seeing that you cannot even export your gas uh, as LNG, that you have to sell it on the domestic market for the beautiful $2.65 per MMBTU, you are not happy. That's for sure. And your shareholders are not happy either. But a lot of the growth of uh, African gas production is also coming from other countries, uh, in particular Angola. Whenever Angola's uh, new liquefaction plant is going to restart and operate normally, Angola will also bring new gas to global gas market. Russia. I don't think I'm ever going to present this market outlook in Russia because the Russians will not like uh, what I have to say, which is that their gas production is not going to increase that much. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of potential. I mean, all the companies, the Gazprom, the Rosneft, the Novatec, they have a lot of potential to increase the gas production. But if your domestic market doesn't grow, then you need to export it. On one side, we have Europe, and there is a little bit of a problem with Europe these days, on top of the fact that, I mean, the gas demand is not there. You know, you can dream about Europe, but uh, if gas demand doesn't increase, gas demand doesn't increase, period. So the other outlet is, of course, as Mr. Putin perfectly understood, this is Asia. This is actually the reason why we have had this final investment decision taken on Yamal. So Yamal is moving forward. Why are we a little bit conservative? Because, I mean, this is very far in the north, and this is also going to be built on permafrost. So we think that uh, it's going to take uh, a few years in order to be built. And same thing for the Russia-China gas pipeline. But these are very good news, and, I mean, a, a significant change in the position of Russia on global gas market. Now, there are also a lot of other projects, other LNG projects, which could move forward. And if I were a Russian investor, then I would definitely bet on the extension of Sakhalin II, because from an economic point of view, and also from the proximity with Japan, Korea, China, this is a project which is making the most sense. But 
the investment decisions in Russia are not always driven by economical considerations, as we all know. So unless Mr. somebody has a little mouse in Mr. Putin's office, we don't know which project is going to move forward. What we can note is that now, you know, it's not only Gazprom who is on the driving seat. There are people behind knocking at the door, and you can be sure about one thing. If the China-Russia gas deal had not been signed, then Rosneft was ready to come, build the pipeline, and export natural gas by pipeline to China. That's almost a certainty. So for Gazprom, there is really a danger, internal danger, and this is the reason why signing this deal was becoming a pressing issue. On commercial gas, we have been talking about on commercial gas for, oh, for quite a few years now. I mean, for sure, shale gas is a reality in North America. This is also starting to be a reality in China, uh, not even one BCM of gas produced, and also in Argentina. But looking forward, uh, we do not anticipate a lot of expansion of shale gas production outside North America. We do recognize, however, that there are some wild cards, uh, in particular Argentina or Mexico. I mean, China, there is definitely shale gas development. But it's not only about shale gas. There is also coal bay methane in Australia, a little bit in China, tight gas in different parts of the world, and also surprisingly, or how, even though this is not exactly uncommercial gas, coal gasification in China. Coal gasification, this is a new way of removing the pollution away from the cities. So actually, you are polluting in Inner Mongolia, and you are sending natural gas towards the coast so that the cities have cleaner air. In terms of CO2 emissions, this is really not very good. But in terms of local pollution, definitely improving. So in a nutshell, we do not anticipate to have a very big expansion of the shale gas revolution outside North America. This is still starting. Countries are still pondering whether or not uh, to move forward. There is still a lot of local opposition, in particular in Europe, where this is far from being an easy task. LNG is what is linking all these parts together. And here, we have a quite dramatic expansion of LNG liquefaction. Most of this expansion is actually coming from one country. This is Australia, seven projects under construction, very expensive projects as well. There is, despite all the talks, only one single project in the US, which is actually under construction and has taken a idea. And we are waiting impatiently to see the others finally, while well, getting all the first approval, and also finally taking final investment decision. But so far, there is only one project. Also, some of the things to look at is the development of a new technology, which is floating LNG. Floating LNG, this is happening in Australia. This is also happening in Malaysia and surprisingly in Colombia. So this is a kind of new technology which could enable the development of stranded assets moving forward. Something definitely to watch in terms of cost, in terms of feasibility, in terms of sort of resistance to weather events. And this LNG, this LNG is definitely to go somewhere, right? Well, a lot of that is going to go not so much to Japan and Korea, where we do not anticipate a rapid growth of natural gas demand, but to China, India, and Southeast Asia. These are the new players. There will be also some growth in the small markets, Latin America and the Middle East. But the most interesting thing is what I call the residual market. This is Europe. 2014, 2015, there is not so much gas, LNG, coming to the market. So actually, the LNG imports in Europe, which were already extremely low in 2013, are going to be even lower. Before, we get more LNG on the global gas market, and then finally, they start to recover. So I mean, this recovery doesn't look much. You know, This is only something like plus 20 BCM between 2019 and 2013. But that would be sufficient in order to cover the incremental import needs in Europe. And why are 
everybody or is everybody interested in exporting to Asia? Well, the picture is relatively self-explanatory, right? This is the average Asian LNG price that you are seeing at the top of the graphic, and it has been quite high. And of course, well, it may make uh, some would-be LNG exporter quite happy, but it's definitely not making happy the Asian countries. And we have seen that all of them are doing whatever they can in order to reduce this import bill. So they have been, for example, contracting some US LNG, but they are also looking at their existing suppliers, looking whether it's possible or not to renegotiate the contracts, which is not an easy task. They are also investing not only in the US, but also in East Africa, in Russia, in order to get also potentially lower gas price. It's not in only contracted, it's also investing upstream. For example, in East Africa, you can see a lot of investments of Asian companies, in particular in Mozambique. Finally, you may remember that last year we published a small report about the potential of developing a trading hub in Asia. We still see a lot of interest towards this potential. However, this is not going to happen tomorrow. The experience shows that at least a decade is necessary in order to develop a functioning and transparent natural gas trading hub in a new region. So in that case, that would be Asia. And to conclude my presentation, a look at Europe. As I mentioned, actually, European gas demand is not going to grow. So the additional import needs are only driven by one thing, the decline, the drop, in domestic gas production. And this is roughly 20 BCM over the period 2013-2019. Now we have many potential sources. And actually, LNG, even though this is not reaching the peak that we had in 2010-11, is still coming back. Some of them is coming back. And here the key variable is actually China's appetite for this LNG. If China doesn't swallow all the LNG, then some can actually come back to Europe, allowing Europe to kind of stabilize its pipeline imports. And in particular, that means for Russia that these pipeline imports are going to be um, limited in terms of growth. Actually, they are slightly declining. You may see towards the end of the graphic, towards the right, for the last year, that actually the Light blue area seems to expand, yes, but this is not Russian gas. This is the Azeri gas, which is finally arriving to Turkey. So in a nutshell, despite all the talks and uh, articles in the newspaper, etc., even with this very pessimistic demand picture, quite normal production picture, it seems very difficult for Europe to decrease substantially its dependency on Russian gas imports. It could maybe do some things in the longer term, but in the medium term, it sounds extremely difficult. Uh, in this scenario, in this report, and in the scenario in, in general, we have not anticipated uh, a scenario of a disruption between Russia, Ukraine, and Europe. So the gas continues to flow as it is today towards Europe. And we have very low gas prices. Thank you very much for your attention. I will now open the floor to questions. Thank you very much, Anne-Sophie. Uh, this was very comprehensive and a lot of uh, uh, timely uh, issues um, that you shared with us and highlighted. Um, maybe I will start off asking you a couple questions before I open the floor. Um, the first one is, um, you, know, the, you did talk about how um, uh, there are quite a few uh, projects in Australia and you know, for uh, quite some time you know, we've been hearing how Australia may be the next Qatar, or it may uh, surpass Qatar. Uh, is that still uh, your outlook? I mean there, there is about 80 BCM of additional LNG capacity which is under construction in Australia so 
Unless there is a hurricane which is destroying a few projects, Australia will become the next Qatar by 2020. We have remained relatively conservative in terms of the arrival of this new LNG uh, and the completion of the LNG plants which are under construction, but adding all the capacity together, Australia will be higher than Qatar, so Australia will become the first LNG, the largest LNG exporter. Unless Qatar suddenly decides to debottleneck a little bit its LNG uh, facilities, then um, it will be a tie, I think. They will be at about the same level. Speaking of Qatar, though, how um, the, the, I guess Qatar uh, shares the, the huge field with Iran, so it has also a lot to do with you know, the scope of Iran coming back to the international market if everything goes well with uh, the nuclear negotiations. So how would you also assess that factor? Is it also, uh, so that's sort of my uh, first part of my question, and, uh, and if, you know, the, this, it's hard to predict when Iran may come back, but how, in what sort of a slope do you think that may affect the, the Qatari uh, export uh, potential? Well, I mean, Qatar has decided to put a moratorium on further exports, and as far as I'm aware of, uh, this has not been lifted. So any other additional project has been frozen so far, and we have not heard that there will be any development besides the industrial developments, I mean, the Zbarzan project, which is actually targeting the domestic gas market. So we have not put in any additional projects or exports, even though, I mean, there are talks about, for example, expanding the Dolphin gas pipeline, which is currently serving uh, Oman and the Emirates, because Qatar does export about 20 BCM of natural gas by pipeline to Oman and the Emirates, but I understand that Qatar is no longer ready to sell very cheap gas to this country, so this gas is going to be at a much higher price, and the negotiations are tough. Regarding Iran, I mean, we actually had a relatively large focus on this country because, I mean, we see that uh, the relationships are getting slightly better. And I think you had this, this comment about uh, the fact that they are sharing the same field. Yes, but unlike Qatar, Iran has a lot of other fields. I mean, uh, South Pass is, of course, a very important asset, but they are also over relatively giant fields. So this is not only about South Pass. South Pass is going to continue to be developed. We have been, I have to admit, relatively conservative because, I mean, it's very difficult to make accurate predictions about Iran, and we, um, we also do not have extraordinary data, as everybody else, and, and it's difficult to go to spy there. Um, but should companies come back progressively to Iran, then we could anticipate a more rapid development of the different phases of South Pass. And uh, it's not that it's going to bring back or to bring Iran to the global LNG market, because, I mean, this is still relatively far away. But Iran has a lot of projects to export to neighboring countries, which relative, require only relatively limited pipeline development. Uh, they just need to agree on the price. I understand, for example, that uh, they have revived this potential agreement between Oman and Iran, but uh, they still need to agree on the price. There could be, however, if this deal was moving forward, some kind of virtual LNG exports coming from Iran, because then the gas from Iran would actually potentially serve to fill in the LNG export facilities in, Iran, in Oman, which are not completely full. What is also important to keep in mind regarding Iran is that you have a lot of potential savings in the domestic market. Uh, they are using roughly one third, one third, one third for residential industry and power generation sector, but it's not efficient at all. I mean, I remember being told that a um, typical household in Iran was using something like uh, 2,000 cubic meters, which is very high compared to European standards. Also, looking at uh, the efficiency of power generation sector, this is not, I mean, typical for Iran. Actually, it's typical for the whole Middle East. The efficiency of the gas power plants are also quite low. I mean, also a uh, consequence of uh, the sanctions, but not only that. And same thing also in the industrial sector. So there is a lot of potential to actually save a little bit of gas there so that this gas could be freed for potential exports.
and Iran definitely has ambitions, and we have also ambitions to attract the companies back to Iran by proposing new terms in terms of upstream development. Thanks so much. So now I'd like to invite uh, uh, folks from the audience and uh, just a few uh, ground rules. Please uh, uh, tell us who you are and who you're with and then ask the question in the form of a question. Hi, my name is Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Um, I'm specifically interested in Sino-Russian relations right now. So um, my question is, if not for Russian natural gas, would China be able to find the gas to meet its demand? And is the same true for oil? OK. I'm going to answer the gas question, because I am a gas expert. You will have the oil expert next week, so you can ask him the question. Um, actually, you know, there are a lot of potential sources for China. I mean, it's LNG. It's Myanmar, it's Central Asia. So I would say that for this deal to be signed, it was really about time, also for the, for, for the Chinese and also for CNPC, because the NDRC was already allowing the construction of some regasification terminals in the northern part of China, basically, I mean, in the region where the pipeline was going to arrive, signaling to CNPC, if you don't sign the deal now, I'm going to give to CNOC the potential to build regasification terminals, and this is going to be LNG. And also do remember that Chinese companies, they are very active in different parts of the world, in East Africa, in Australia, in Russia, also in Canada, in order to get some LNG back uh, to, to China. So there are potential other sources. And also there is a big question mark around shale gas. I mean, shale gas, we are slightly more optimistic uh, for the medium term with the fooling uh, area from Sinopec, which is going to contribute to help them meeting their 6.5 BCM target by 2015. For the long term, we remain relatively conservative, but uh, we do recognize that uh, shale gas could grow much rapidly than anybody anticipates. However, as everybody agrees uh, on Chinese shale gas, I mean, this is really a question of faith. Are they going to achieve the same miracle than the US? We shall see. We still, we still need a lot of data. Right now, costs are very high. They need to tackle a lot of issues on pricing, on regulation, on infrastructure, on water management. But there is a potential. Just to add on to that question, so uh, you, you did mention that uh, um, the, the longer target, the 2020 target. So it comes in a huge range, actually. The, it's the 60 to 100, um, the million, uh, yeah. Uh, so is it, but can they achieve, I mean, do you think the Chinese will hit uh, somewhere in that range or not even 60 in your view? Um, to be honest, we are, I mean, we, first of all, we are looking only at 2019, so there is still one year to go. We, we are slightly below that, uh, but as I mentioned, I mean, we do recognize the potential of achieving better results than anticipated. Uh, it's going to be easier to say when we have more results of what is going on for Sinopec, for CNPC, and see how the companies are handling and with, uh, how they are decreasing the drilling cost, because the drilling costs remain relatively high in this region. Thank you. Else? Yes. Um, David Livingston, Carnegie Endowment. I have two small questions. The first one is if you could elaborate a bit more on how you see the evolution of capacity markets impacting ultimate gas demand um, over the, the medium term in Europe in particular, but also if how it might affect that 0.5% um, increase in overall um, gases role in the overall power mix uh, uh, to, to 2018, 2020. And then second of all, um, if you could just discuss a little bit about gas to liquids, whether you see any geographies where, where that has significant and, and su sustainable potential. Yeah, regarding capacity markets, actually, we looked at that last year in last year's report uh, a little bit. And our conclusion, which still holds, is that capacity market, this is good to make sure that the companies are investing in capacity so that this capacity is going to be available when needed. But when I'm looking now at uh, the gas use, in the power generation sector, this is still determined by the pricing relationship. And in the absence of either a higher price for coal or a higher CO2 price, well, I mean, this is no-brainer. Gas is not competitive. At $7 per MMTU, 
it starts to be competitive for the most efficient natural gas power plants because coal prices came down also, and we have relatively low um, CO2 prices in Europe in general, apart from the UK. Uh, regarding GTL, well, I think there were a lot of plans about GTL, but uh, none of them is actually moving forward. I mean, some companies have just scrapped uh, their uh, GTL plans. The last I heard about was uh, in Mozambique. Uh, we shall see, because I mean, Mozambique is really at a very early stage of its developments. It could be that GTL is one of the options uh, taken by the government to monetize their gas resources internally, but uh, we are really at a too early stage to be able to say that this is going to move forward. Anyone else? Oh, Fiona, back there. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Hi, Arba Johnson with Itochu. Could you elaborate a little more on your thoughts about gas and transport? Um, I assume China is mostly trucking, but what about other parts of the world and vehicles? I think you're a bit more bullish than some other folks. Thank you. Okay, I mean, uh, the gas used in transport, this is, uh, it really depends on the region we are looking at. So China, we do anticipate a rapid growth because, I mean, this is just part of, part of the strategy to reduce the local air pollution. So they are doing everything, including NGVs, but also uh, EVs, hybrids, etc. So this is really part of that. Um, actually, an use of gas in transport is also quite popular in Latin America, in Brazil, in Argentina, but here the issue, especially in Argentina, is that they do not have enough gas supply, so they have a tendency to uh, now cut down a little bit the supplies to this, uh, to this particular sector, because, I mean, it's actually sometimes also quite important to have gas for power generation sector. And we see the same issue happening in Pakistan, for example, where, I mean, there are also a lot of NGVs, more than two million. Uh, we see that happening in Bangladesh. So in many developing countries, despite the interest to develop natural gas vehicles, uh, it sometimes fell victim because of the lack of supply. One of the countries which doesn't have any problem in terms of supply, this is, of course, the United States, which is going to be the second fastest growing market after China. And another region where there is a potential for growth, there is definitely a lot of interest coming from uh, the market players. This is Europe, because Europe has plenty of underutilized LNG regasification capacity, which could be used for tracking, etc. cetera. Um, however, some investors are relatively prudent because uh, they don't know to what extent they could count on uh, fis uh, f fiscal stability. You know, governments, they, when they see something working well, they say, wow, new money, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Let me task, the tax that a little bit. So this is really the feedback that I'm getting from some investors. But we see that in the Nordic countries, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Norway, I mean, there is more and more interest to developing these micro liquefaction plants and also um, using the broader regasification terminal in order to serve smaller scale LNG facilities. So this is happening, but probably not as rapidly as China. Hi, Alex Benedetto with SNL Energy. Uh, U.S. legislators have been pushing legislation to expedite U.S. LNG exports, several of them stating that specifically to look at aiding Central and Eastern European countries. And I know that there were diplomats from some of those countries here a few months ago that said simply pushing exports would send a market signal and that some market signals have already been sent so that contracts are a bit more negotiable. Can you comment at all on the impact of pushing US LNG exports or what impact exports could have on Central and Eastern European countries in terms of their ability to negotiate contracts and work with Russian gas suppliers? 
Uh, we have, of course, noticed this uh, push of uh, U.S. legislators towards uh, U.S. LNG. As I said, I mean, there is only one single project which has taken final investment decisions. So if you want to help these countries or the world in general, because, I mean, after all, you cannot have any control on where the gas is going to go, then you need to have these companies taking final investment decisions now because there will be probably some three more years to go before these LNG plants are operational. So, I mean, U.S. LNG for 2014-15 is not going to help anybody. Uh, second, the only actually uh, Central European country which has a functioning LNG terminal, this is Poland. So, of course, we can reorganize the flows, etc. but if you want to target one specific country, uh, Ukraine, uh, Slovakia, etc., for good reasons, they do not have any LNG terminal. Um, finally, um, well, I would be very interested to see uh, what the U.S. legislators have in mind when they say that uh, they want to send natural gas to these countries, because in order for the gas to arrive to these countries, then you need to have an agreement with the companies there. Uh, I am not aware that um, SPP, Polish oil and gas, or whoever else in Central Europe has signed a long-term agreement to import U.S. LNG so far, raising the question how the gas is going to arrive to these countries if it has not been contracted. Hello. You touched on the challenges of uh, water conservation. Uh, Thomas Lamero from Georgetown University touched on water challenges in developing shale gas. I wonder where in the world that would be the biggest challenge and what they're doing to either alleviate or how that will um, impact development in the medium term. I got untidy the whole question. I'm sorry. So ch the challenge is to develop shale gas. Uh, water. Uh, oh, water. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, water remains a very important issue. Uh, well, this is the case definitely in the U.S. I mean, we, we, we are still waiting on actually, uh, maybe I missed it, uh, the results of the EPA study on that. That has been, I think, talked about for 2000, since 2010. Ah, okay. Yeah. Then I have not seen it. But um, I mean, I think that water is among the main issues. Uh, to address it, it's really on the country by country. Uh, this is among the reasons why there is so much local opposition. The companies know that in order for the shale gas to be a success in uh, many regions, uh, water has to be solved. I mean, in China, for example, when you are looking at uh, China, the gas resources, also the coal mining operation or coal gasification, which are all water intensive, they are all kind of targeting the same water reservoirs. So there is really an issue there in order for uh, all these companies and these energy sources to sustain the development of Chinese economy to solve the water issue by doing more in terms of recycling. Same thing applies, actually, I was reading an article this morning about uh, Saudi Aramco and how Saudi Arabia wants to develop the, the shale gas that they have. Well, I mean, also a lot of recycling. You need to become much more efficient in terms of recycling. If I can just quickly add to that uh, discussion, you know, the, the, a lot of service companies that are based in the West, you know, including the United States, are looking, I mean, that's one of the key areas where they're focusing uh, R&D to see how uh, much they can recycle. And it's unique to, you know, each shale um, is unique, so it's a little hard to say, you know, okay, uh, I, I, well, for example, I guess in, you know, one shale within the U.S., the recovery rate is as high as like 90% from what I understand. but. But, you know, but in other parts of the United States, you know, it's much lower. And, but there is expertise, there is technology that's you know, that are look, being looked at. So to what extent then some of these countries, say, you know, China, could be India, that do have both the quantity and also qualitative water issues can really successfully, you know, adopt them, uh, the uh, U.S. or Western technology and expertise and then uh, to their, you know, specific needs and then go forward. It's another part of, I think, the discussion. Um, so, questions? Yes. 
Hi, M Michael Radner with Congressional Research Service. Thank you for your presentation today. Could you disaggregate Europe a, a bit and talk about any countries that you see increasing demand for gas, uh, or is it just flat across the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a very good point because, um, well, OECD Europe includes Turkey, and Turkey is one of the genuinely growing market. Uh, Central Eastern Europe, frankly, they, I mean, I have done some uh, energy reviews of their policy, and I mean, they do not like gas. I mean, anyway, I mean, there is no mystery. You look at the map, Central Europe, Russia. They do not like gas. For them, it's synonymous of dependency to Russia. Uh, another country where we have some growth, as I mentioned in my speech, is uh, the United Kingdom, because there, actually, you are decommissioning some uh, old coal power plants. So that needs to be replaced to produce new uh, power demand. And uh, this is going to be replaced by natural gas. But otherwise, we do not have a country where there is a very happy story about natural gas. I mean, the only one that uh, you can say is relatively optimistic is Turkey, and that's it. Speaking of that, the region, actually, uh, more from the supply side, is uh, does Israel count as OEC Asia? Was it by your by the IEA yeah. definition? Can yeah. you speak about their uh, sort of supply outlook as well? Yes, I mean, sorry about that, but actually somehow Israel has landed in Asia Oceania, which of course uh, makes absolute sense to put them with Australia, Japan, and Korea. That aside, uh, Israel definitely a lot of gas. I mean, uh, so far, Tamar, which has been operating since April 2013, is operating very well. I think they're on target, if not beyond target. Uh, they are producing something on an annual basis like 7.5 billion cubic meters, and they are on the way to actually double that by 2016, which is very good news uh, for the country, but also for some uh, surrounding countries, because they have now signed an agreement with the Palestinian Authority to export a little bit of the gas towards uh, this uh, region, uh, also depending on whether the Palestinian Authority can actually build the gas power plant in time. And they are going to supply some Jordanian um, industrials, I think uh, Jordan Potash and another one that I don't remember. So actually, when we are looking at uh, Israel's exports, there are two things. First, there is a 40% limit, so how much gas can actually be exported and how to export it. And right now, we see that, I mean, there is more push toward exporting by pipeline rather by LNG, Woodside pulled out. But it may be that actually some of this gas is going to be exported as LNG if, and but this is a big if, if, they managed to have an agreement with Egypt, whereby we are building some uh, pipeline, offshore pipelines, but there is no potential terrorist attack, which are going to feed the two absolutely underutilized or actually non-utilized LNG liquefaction plants in Egypt. Uh, that would make Union Fenosa and BG, which have just signed deals with uh, Israel on that, very happy, I am pretty sure. But this is a political deal now. I mean, you need this to be approved by Israeli government and Egyptian government. Piece of cake. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Mallory Lee Wong with Johns Hopkins University. You mentioned that uh, in China, coal to gasification is to grow significantly. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the drivers behind this trend, if you could break down the domestic market picture a little bit more, and then if you are as, if you, if you see the outlook being positive past the medium term as well, even though that might be hard to predict. Thank you. Yeah, over the past two years, we have started looking at that a little bit more carefully because we were seeing that uh, the government was suddenly approving a lot of projects. And uh, last year, this number of projects amounted to the amazing 200 billion cubic meters. So with our 40 BCM of uh, actually gas production coming from this process, we are relatively conservative. Um, why are we nevertheless seeing this happening? Because, I mean, from an economic point of view, it does make sense. Uh, water, however, could be an issue in specific areas, so this is going to be a case-by-case -case study. Um, also, I mean, as I mentioned, the biggest problem in my view is the fact that 
even though this is removing the pollution away from the cities, which is really, I mean, as I mentioned, this is the number one priority right now. It's still not good at all from an environmental perspective because you are still producing a lot of CO2 uh, when you are actually gasifying the coal. So unless there is CO2 sequestration associated with this project upstream, the environmental benefits of the whole process are not completely obvious. So I think for, for China, this is the thing to tackle. But otherwise, I mean, it's also solving a big bottleneck, which is transporting all the coal towards the eastern part of the country. I mean, right now, there is really a congestion. So you are no longer con uh, con transporting coal. You are transporting natural gas by pipeline or gas pipeline. Anyone else? Enjoy. Oh, yes, Michael. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Hi. On um, North American exports, what is your criteria? You said you included only one project, the Chenier project, because it's on, under construction or reached FID. What's your criteria for use for inputting a project into your uh, as into your forecast? Um, because there's a lot more projects if you include Canada as well that are potentially coming online by the end of the decade. Um, and so I'm just curious how you incorporate that. Is it FID? Mm -hmm. Is it groundbreaking or, or what? Yeah, I mean, we definitely look at uh, final investment decision. But in the case of the US, actually, the US is exporting more gas than the Chenier project alone will uh, actually uh, be based on. Uh, because we have anticipated that more FIDs would be taken right now, I mean, in the next uh, 18 months, which are going to enable some projects to move forward and to contribute to additional LNG. This can take place because US LNG is going to take less time to be built than a traditional liquefaction plant. However, for Canada, uh, we still have not seen any final investment decision. I don't know whether they are close or not, but I don't think so. I mean, there is still a lot of negotiation uh, with the First Nations in particular. Most of the big projects which are currently under discussion are relatively expensive as well. So we do not anticipate any Canadian, big Canadian project to be online by 2019. That said, there are some very small projects which maybe if they are based on floating energy, which seems to be built in less time, could potentially come online by 2019. But this is a big if, and this is not the base case in our assumptions. But as I mentioned, I mean, floating LNG, there are a lot of people, especially in Malaysia, which are apparently building these things relatively fast. It's worth really looking at that in more details. Divya Reddy from Eurasia Group. Um, I just have a question about your assumptions on Chinese demand, particularly in the power and industrial sectors. Are there specific policies that you assume will be implemented in the next few years that will actually meet, make those, um, allow them to meet those estimates? I mean, in terms of the modeling and in terms of power demand in particular, so we do the modeling for power demand. Uh, then, I mean, we uh, look at uh, the development of nuclear generation, which is basically based on the existing projects. I mean, the World Nuclear Association has a very complete database, so you can basically make your estimates based on that. Uh, our renewable team, which is going to actually publish its medium-term renewable report at the end of August 2014, has given me all their input in terms of additional renewable generation. So the reminder is essentially coal and gas. And then, I mean, there is a question also here of what are the targets of the um, government in terms of new gas power plants, and we assume that they are going to be used at a certain rate. Uh, we do agree that if you are only looking at the economic feasibility of coal versus gas, this is not always uh, working in favor of gas. But there is also a push coming from the government, especially in the northern region, so that, I mean, the companies are actually signing for uh, gas in order to supply the gas power plants. So this is part of this environmental push to diminish uh, the local air pollution. 
Uh, for industry, I mean, this is really part of the general growth, so I mean, this is more linked to, uh, to GDP in general. We do, however, think that there is a small potential to be realized, but more in the longer term, of a switch between, I mean, the coal which is used in the industry, which is actually quite a large part of the overall coal used in China, towards natural gas, but progressively. One thing is sure for industrials in China, they need to be sure that they can rely on natural gas, that they are not going to be cut in the middle of the winter. And so far, the market is still in a stage of development. So they need to have more certainty. But as soon as they have certainty that, I mean, they can get the gas and that the gas is not too expensive, then probably they will switch to gas. Anyone else? Yes, yeah, back there. Hi, I'm Charles Gini from Bank of America. Uh, you mentioned a couple times uh, the potential for natural gas to be used in uh, maritime shipping. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about uh, what some of the existing projects are or what the challenges are for, uh, or the potential outlook. Yeah, as you mentioned, as you know, probably, I mean, uh, starting in 2015, there will be new regulations in terms of the sulfur emission, basically, uh, in some regions which are called the ECA, emission control areas, uh, two of them are uh, around North America and in the northern part of Europe, and you cannot use, um, I mean, the high sulfur fuel oil, this is no longer possible. So you have basically three options, so you can either use marine diesel oil, which means that, I mean, there is no investment required but this is awfully expensive. You can use scrubbers, uh, which are kind of installations that you can put on your boat, uh, which allows you to actually remove the sulfur. Uh, it's not always easy to install on every single boat. I mean, some of these things are only four meters high. You can see, uh, I mean, the size, etc., on, on the websites of the providers. Uh, some of them are much bigger, like uh, 16 meters. Uh, so, I mean, this requires, of course, investment. And the third option is LNG. Uh, two options here, either you convert your existing boat into LNG, but knowing that this is going to affect the room available if you are transporting goods, because I mean, first of all, LNG is uh, bigger in terms of volume than uh, conventional oil, but also you need to have a hull, uh, you know, the kind of envelope which is protecting your reservoir, which is going to be thicker because, well, natural gas LNG is going to be transported at minus 160 degrees. Uh, does that make sense? Well, it really depends on the difference of the gas prices on one side and uh, the marine diesel oil prices on the other side. So this is really the biggest uncertainty for anybody investing in this kind of uh, new area. This is uh, actually also the main uncertainty for anybody right now looking at invest in road transport. I mean, to what extent is uh, differential between gas prices and oil prices be going, going to be sustained for the next five or 10 years? I mean, you know, in road transport, you have a lot of um, uh, change of the material of the trucks, but uh, you are not changing a boat every two years. So, I mean, there is more danger here. Um, and also, I think a lot of people are waiting to see whether the International Maritime Organization is going to enlarge the limit in terms of sulfur emission to the international seas sooner or later. Is it going to be 2020? Then maybe LNG starts to become interesting, or is it going to be 2025? Anyone else? Do I get to ask you one more question? I hope. Um, so obviously, you know, we're looking at the uh, midterm. Uh, that's sort of the, the time horizon for, for the presentation. But some of the stuff that you anticipate may be game changers. I mean, I think Iran came up a couple mm -hmm. of times. But say, you know, between 2020 and 2030, uh, you know, on the supplier side, um, you know, who may also be sort of a, a big sort of a shaker, mover. And then also technology-wise, uh, you did touch upon floating LNG, but could that be a significant game changer? Um, or in, in, and uh, when you think about it, you know, as, and as an analyst, not necessarily, you know, sort of going through some of the highlights, what are some of the steps that you, you, you know, look out for? I mean, 
projecting? Um, I think in terms of game changers, I've already said that several times, but for me, Chinese shale gas is probably one of the biggest one in terms of the size. Uh, some of you may remember we had published two years ago the golden rules for a golden age of gas, in which we were looking at different gas scenarios for agricultural gas in different regions, in particular in China. And the, the difference uh, in terms of commercial gas production in China can be relatively large, whether you are very bullish or whether you are not bullish at all. I mean, it can be up to 280 BCM by 2035. So with that, of course, you have consequences both on demand but also on uh, supply in terms of the import needs. So this is relatively large. Iran, of course, uh, is the elephant in the room. Um, as I said, in terms of regional pipeline exports, yes, it could come to the interna international scene. In terms of LNG, unless this is filling in uh, the underutilized utilis uh, LNG liquefaction plants in surrounding countries, I don't think we are going to see any Iranian LNG before 2025. East Africa is the other new, much awaited supplier, uh, which I mean, has plenty of gas could be surprising or not. I mean, it's really a question of how fast the companies which are there are going to take their final investment decisions. So far, they are, I mean, they are targeted 2018, which is way too ambitious because, I mean, they have not even taken final investment decision. Um, so it's not crystal clear how fast they are going to proceed, knowing that, I mean, the governments are relatively new in terms of the gas scene. Uh, they don't want to be screwed by companies which have thousands of lawyers, which is understandable. Uh, they also want to keep some of the gas for themselves. Uh, in particular, Tanzania, it made clear that they want to keep some of the gas for the domestic market, which may actually lead to a fear that there could be some kind of Egyptian syndrome. You know, you are agreeing with the government, I'm going to use this gas for my domestic market, you are going to take this gas for exports. And a few years later, where well, the government is knocking at your door and saying, well, actually, I need the gas because my people are rioting. So. Sorry for your LNG and all your investment, but I'm going to take the gas. Doesn't, um, doesn't um, uh, Myanmar also have something similar, if I'm not mistaken? Like they, this, there was some recent, or maybe about a year ago, domestic, I'm not up to date, but uh, domestic legislation or movement to ha have a cap on how much they want to export. Uh, I cannot the, remember. Okay, it may, it, it may be true, actually, but Myanmar is such a small market, yeah. and they have also a lot of hydro potential. Yeah. So, I mean, their gas use uh, cannot be really big. I mean, Mozambique and Tanzania, it, it could potentially be uh, a bit bigger. And then floating LNG, uh, or the technology side? Fl floating LNG, yes, definitely. But, I mean, otherwise, uh, I mean, for me, the, the biggest thing is definitely energy efficiency, uh, not always in terms of improving, you know, the, the end user demand, but also at the intermediate level, uh, looking at the efficiency of uh, power plants. I mean, this is very low in many countries, and there is definitely a lot to do to improve the efficiency of the existing fire, ga gas power plants or oil power plants or coal power plants. I mean, people need to invest more because, I mean, in terms of investment, this is lower cost, and it can improve uh, the economics of a lot of projects and a lot of, uh, help also a lot of countries which have difficulties to afford for the fuels. Well, thank you so much, Anne Sophie, for coming and presenting. And uh, please join me in thanking her with a round of applause. Thank you.